Okay, well, we're we're at um, four o'clock, so I'll I'll hand over to um, uh, Joanna Newman, the Secretary General of the Association of Commonwealth Universities, who's very kindly agreed to chair this panel on reparations uh, and restitution for slavery and colonialism. Joanna, thank you. Thank you very much, Philip, and it's a it's a great honour to chair this session. It's These are issues which I, as a historian, have thought about for many years, but also as uh, the chief exec of an association of universities born in empire, born in 1913, uh, born actually during the last global pandemic, in fact, in, uh, of, of Spanish flu. Uh, that was a, So my organisation is a child of empire and is now represents what one hopes is the best of the modern Commonwealth and how universities behave in that Commonwealth is of extreme importance. Universities, we think, have a huge voice in recognizing their own role through history and educating the next generation um, and to address both historic wrongs, but also current huge inequalities, not least exposed uh, by COVID. The ACU has a Peace and Reconciliation Network, which recently had a conference at Stellenbosch University looking at uh, the role of arts in historic, uh, in addressing historic trauma. Um, and it's a network that addresses a wide range of issues from how universities can work with indigenous uh, students and communities through to um, reparations and addressing historic wrongs. Um, and they also have a, a responsibility to show leadership and support students but they also often reinforce structures and systems of power and privilege. In my own research, of course, going back to European history, um, it was after all German universities that expelled their Jewish students and professors in the 1930s. Um, and they often reinforce structures of power and privilege. And I think after this pandemic, after the, more, uh, the, the most recent iteration of Black Lives Matter, after the murder of George Floyd, they cannot ignore calls to reform. Neither can governments, neither can civil society, neither can the private sector. So um, I am honored to be chairing a panel with three very, very distinguished speakers. And I'm going to ask each of them to provide a background on their approach to the issue before starting more general question and answer. And I'll just do a, a short introduction of each uh, panelist. So uh, Professor Sir Hilary Beckles is the Vice Chancellor of the University of the West Indies. He sits on the ACU's a regional Committee of the Americas, but it's importantly, he's chairman of the CARICOM Reparations Commission, which has a 10 point reparation plan, which includes a formal apology, repatriation and debt cancellation. Um, Professor Beckles, you've said, and I hope you don't mind if I quote you, that today the realization is emerging that only a process of reparations can begin to fully heal these wounds. Repair, restitution and recompense for historical crimes is a profound moral obligation, both on the parts of the perpetrators and the victims of these crimes. And a revived movement for reparative justice is taking shape in the Caribbean and around the world where African people live and continue to struggle for their inalienable, inalienable human rights and basic dignity. Catherine Cole is Secretary General of the Commonwealth Association of Museums, and we met Catherine a, long, a while ago in Fiji at the uh, Commonwealth Education Minister's Conference. It's a network of post-colonial museums that reflects on colonial legacies and develops new international relationships and working practices. And she's led a project on human remains management in Southern Africa and works through Canada and internationally with a focus on decolonization, particularly in the Arctic, Western Canada and throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, Professor Kathleen Mahoney is a professor of law at the University of Calgary and specializes in the law of tort, human rights, as well as indigenous legal principles. She was the chief negotiator for the Assembly of First Nations in the historic Indian Residential Schools Settlement Agreement in Canada, which was the largest settlement in Canadian history for 150,000 uh, 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 claimants. She asserts that this feat could not have been accomplished through normal legal processes, either in courts or in traditional settlement negotiations. So um, with that, I'd like to start, if I may, with you, Hilary, if you could want to give a, a brief summary of your, your approach to uh, reparations for slavery and colonialism. You're on mute. You need to... Is that better? 
Yes, that's great. There you go. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joanna, and very much for your introduction. And uh, in the three minutes or so, I wish to make uh, just two observations. One, that at the moment, I, I find myself at the crossroads, at the intersection where uh, the development of university culture, uh, the process of nation building, and, and the celebration of humanity's finest values uh, at the intersect. And it is this intersection that uh, has enabled my own approach and has determined how I proceed to participate in this process uh, for the dignity of colonial, colonized people, especially those who have been enslaved. I have the fortune or misfortune, uh, depending on how you look at it, to be the vice chancellor of a university with uh, three campuses that were built on slave plantations. So the campuses themselves physically uh, emerge on lands that were hitherto uh, used as plantations uh, with a slave base. From time to time, when we are excavating uh, the ground to, to, to construct buildings, the, 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 the evidentiary basis of this erupts. Um, the Mona campus in Jamaica, for example, 10 years ago, we were building a medical faculty and while the bulldozers were doing what they had to do, they uh, stumbled upon the slave cemetery. So hundreds and hundreds of bones began to emerge from the ground. And when we did the historical research, we realized that the site was the burial ground for hundreds of enslaved Africans who were just buried in a mass, in a mass shallow grave circumstance. So the reality of slavery and colonization is very much in the forefront of the, the physical environment and of course, consequentially, the emotional environment of everyone who participates in the university. Our strategic plan is built around three pillars, uh, access, alignment and agility. Each, each time we press the button to pursue development on these three pillars, again, we encounter legacies of slavery and colonization access. Um, the, the, we are in a part of the world, um, in the American hemisphere, where we have the lowest enrollment in adult higher education and of course, the reasons for that are historically determined. When we speak about alignment, the alignment of the university to the private sector, to the state sector, again, what we uh, encounter there are the legacies of colonization, the colonial mess left behind by Britain, and the tremendous difficulty in cleaning up this colonial mess in order to facilitate development and nation building. So, all around us, all around us, between us and around us, we are confronting daily the headwind of the legacies of colonization, uh, slavery, deceptive indentureship in the case of the, the Indian and Chinese people who were brought here. And so development for us, advancement is all about confronting and pushing back and uprooting the legacies of slavery and colonization. So the university is in the vanguard of that, which makes my own approach to this subject multidimensional. Yes, I am an economic historian who uh, has studied uh, the rise of the global empires, the British Empire especially, built upon the basis of native genocide, African enslavement, deceptive indentureship. So from the professional point of view, from the intellectual point of view, from the point of view of being a citizen uh, and um, within this kind of historical space, all of these forces have shaped how I have approached uh, my role, wearing the hat I wish, I wish I wear as chairman of the Caribbean Reparations Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And if I could now turn to Catherine, uh, if you could, um, if you could give us your opening remarks, please. Joanna, thank you. Uh, nice to see you again, Joanna. And thank you for the opportunity, Philip, to participate in this discussion this morning. 
Um, I'm sorry that because it is it is only nine o'clock in the morning in Alberta, um, I only I caught the last session, which was really interesting, having been at Chagham when the whole Windrush thing was exploding on the steps outside us. Um, I will just say a little bit about my background personally. Um, I appreciate the comments about Cam. Uh, I am myself Métis. Uh, my great, great, great grandfather was a Scottish fur trader and um, I'm descended from him and his Métis wife. Um, and I think that's colored a lot of what I do and think. Um, I worked in the Solomon Islands from 1991 to 1993 on a project about the preservation of indigenous culture in Melanesia. I was working at the time on a PhD at Leicester on the role of um, museums in preserving indigenous culture. And, and I, I faced racism at the University of Leicester from my thesis advisor who thought that this whole focus on indigenous issues was just a flash in the pan. And when I told her that I was uh, Métis on my mother's side and part black on my father's side, she just was horrified and said, no one in the UK would admit to such a thing. Uh, so it's kind of hard to be in a program with somebody who has those sorts of attitudes which is why I left. So I, th I think that the implications of this sort of systemic racism, they, they go far, you know, into ways that we don't really necessarily think about at the time that it's happening sometimes. You know, for all intents and purposes, I look white and so people assume that's what I am. But I think having a mixed background uh, and being an historian, you know, as an historian, you pay attention to the past and your own personal past as well as the world's past. So that's sort of where I'm coming from is having had this complex background. Uh, Cam, as you mentioned, has, we've had a long focus on decolonization. It's, it's, it is what we're interested in. And the project that we've been doing on human remains management in Southern Africa was really illuminating for me because we applied three or four times to the Commonwealth Foundation for funding. We're rejected every time. And we were rejected because they didn't understand the connection between human remains and human rights. And, you know, we asked them, have you ever seen the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples? You know, this, this, this is really critical. So what we're dealing with in Southern Africa is a very complex history of not just British colonialization, but German uh, colonialization as well. And the German genocide period in the early 20th century and the thousands of sets of human remains that are in the, Muse the Zico Museum of South Africa, as well as in museums in Europe. And trying to figure out how to manage those remains that were collected ethically and how to return those remains that were collected unethically. And the first workshop that we had at the Zico Museum in, in Cape Town, um, we invited indigenous people to come to the session. We, you know, we wanna have a conversation about how to handle, how to manage your ancestors' remains respectfully. And they actually said to us, this is the first time we've ever been invited into the museum. So they're just starting a conversation and don't know yet where it will take you. And because we have you know, so many countries involved, uh, Namibia, Botswana, South Africa, Germany, UK, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really complicated stuff. And it's very emotional stuff. And what people don't necessarily expect when you're working on these things intellectually, um, it's how much it will hit you personally. So we've had, we've had a lot of trauma that we've had to deal with. Um, it, in these conversations. And I would say we've, we've now had four workshops um, dealing with this issue and um, the conversation has really become much richer as people have had time to think about it and explore those issues. Uh, there are serious issues around reparations. I, I don't know if reparations can or will ever be paid for this, but in Namibia, for example, they have repatriated a number of remains from European museums, but they won't yet rebury them because that is the physical evidence of what happened. And until they get receive reparations, they're not prepared to rebury the remains. Um, so um, it's, it's very difficult work and it's really important work. And one of the things that we face is people saying, well, why don't they just get over it? You know, move on. And we have the same issues in Canada in terms of uh, indigenous um, issues here. And I'll leave Kathleen to talk about that because you know, she's actually better informed on the facts of it all than I am. But, um, you know, with, with the kind of reparations that have been paid for residential school survivors, the, the generational trauma that has resulted from all of that is something that we still deal with every day in people's lives. And the average person doesn't understand that or respect that or um, give it the credibility it deserves. So it, it's, it's very difficult stuff and very important. And I think that we need to really... Um, focus on the human rights aspects of all of this. I'll leave it there for now. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And if I could now just turn to Kathleen. Kathleen, is your video uh, available to be turned on or, or, or not? Um, just a second. Uh, it says choose. Uh, I'm just clicking on the start the video um, icon, and it just I'm given some cho some choices. FaceTime camera. Uh, Should I? It's got a check mark on. I thought I was on video. Um, I'm not. I'm. I'm not. You're not on video at the moment. Um, I, I. I suggest what we might do is ask um, somebody at the uh, School of Advanced Studies just to send you a message about what what you might do because I'm not quite sure what the platform is and perhaps now if we just if you just want to uh, talk about um your, your initial uh, observations that would be great yeah and um, can I um I, uh, if um it may be your machine if you if you press the start video button towards the the um the left hand side but we can hear you very clearly which is the the main thing so um uh, why, why not go ahead? Okay. All right. I, I think I, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and I'll, I'll play with it a little bit when somebody yeah. else is talking rather than myself. All right. Thank you so much. It's a real honor to be participating in this, in this panel. And um, I know it's going to be fascinating to hear all of the, the speakers as we go forward. Uh, my, uh, my position or my, my, my uh, pers per perspective on reparations um, arose out of my uh, background uh, in tort law, which I've taught for many, many years at the university, uh, which is a colonial, you know, British system of law of dealing with personal injuries. Um, and uh, also, uh, at the same time, I was involved with tort laws, involved with human rights, and realized that realized made me realize to some extent how narrow uh, tort law was in terms of reparations. <coughs> When I became involved with Indigenous law, I realized that uh, really um, the way in which we do things, the way in which we solve problems is so narrow and so focused on values that Indigenous peoples don't share uh, that the system of law that we operate under is just simply um, inadequate in so many ways. When, when I was uh, given the opportunity to participate in trying to resolve the Indian residential school uh, tragedy in, in Canada, um, it became very evident that uh, Canadian law would not deal with this issue appropriately. I'll just give you a little bit of background about what happened. For 150 years in Canada, uh, there was an assimilation project that basically operated under the motto that you can't kill the Indian, but you can kill the Indian in the child. This uh, this statement was uh, was uh, in official government documents, um, so there was no question that uh, this assimilation project was uh, set out to destroy uh, the culture and identity of of, of Native people in Canada, and um, so one of the ways in which this assimilation project uh, was put into to place was in schooling. And so Indian children or indigenous children, Aboriginal children uh, were taken from their homes uh, by law and put into uh, boarding school situations, uh, some of them for their entire childhood uh, from the age of three or four up until their teenage years. Um, these schools were brutal uh, places where children were punished severely for trying to speak their own languages. Many of them came into the schools unilingual in their own indigenous language, but uh, were forced to uh, learn English. They were forced to practice uh, religion that wasn't their own. The churches, the schools were run by basically the Catholic church, but also the Anglican United Presbyterian uh, churches. And um, these uh, children uh, suffered all kinds of abuse in addition to psychological abuse. There was all sorts of sexual and physical, emotional abuse that went on there. So um, the intergenerational harm was profound. Uh, the harms to the students themselves was incredible. Um, there was just a whole range of psychological and physical harms. Um, so uh, Canada had never really 
come to grips with this problem. It was hidden. It wasn't, wasn't written up in any school textbooks. Most, most non-Indigenous Canadians knew nothing about it. Um, and if they did, it was a very superficial knowledge. Uh, so it came as kind of a, um, a shock to a lot of Canadians when this hit the, uh, the news and the mass media uh, that this had gone on. Uh, but it became apparent that uh, some, el some other way of resolving it had to develop. Now, uh, it was an interesting, um, an interesting set of uh, leverages that, that put this issue on the forefront, because obviously government did not want to deal with it, but uh, some courageous Indigenous people came to the courts, even though that solution would not deal with what they were interested in dealing with, but it created pressure on the courts. There was something like 12,000 cases in court, which was bringing the court system to, to a grinding halt and uh, in many jurisdictions. And so uh, government was forced to start talking about how they could settle this out of court. So the AFN engaged um, myself uh, and others, but we were led by the national chief, uh, Phil Fontaine, who uh, is an incredible national leader of Indigenous people. And we launched into a consultation project from coast to coast to coast uh, to talk to victims, uh, survivors as they prefer to be called, and uh, their families and elders and others and heard from them what they wanted. What they wanted was not anything the legal system could deliver. Uh, basically, they wanted healing. They wanted an opportunity to tell their stories and be believed. They wanted uh, equality. They wanted um, commemoration for those who had passed away. Uh, they wanted intergenerational um, healing remedies. And, and uh, there was compensation, but what's really interesting is when you go through the uh, transcripts of these consultation sessions, um, compensation was there uh, because many of these people are extremely uh, poor, most of them are, um, but it wasn't a priority. The priorities were restoring their languages and culture, um, being able to tell their story, healing, and uh, commemorating and making sure this would never happen again. Uh, so based on those uh, principles, uh, we formed a team, uh, basically made up of uh, mostly non-lawyers, but survivors or children of survivors, and uh, shocked the legal system because uh, 80 other lawyers were around the negotiating table and we came in uh, with, without the you know, Bay Street or you know, big firm lawyers and personal injury around the table, but rather uh, a gender balanced, uh, predominantly indigenous uh, group of people who were largely non-lawyers and we were able to take over the negotiations and um, come up with a very multifaceted package of reparations, uh, which essentially addressed the existential crisis in Canada that the non-indigenous people were feeling by having a nationwide truth commission by having um, uh, apology from the prime minister in the House of Commons. And for the first time in our history, indigenous peoples on the floor of the house to receive that apology. Well, by the way, it's on YouTube if anybody wants to, to, to see it, it's quite dramatic. Um, to have a package of reparations for both uh, the generalized loss of language and culture in terms of in terms of dollars, as well as individual compensation for those who had individually been uh, abused, sexually, physically, or otherwise. So the package itself in, in monetary terms was worth uh, over now, now it, that's just winding down all costs in, not administrative costs, but uh, cost uh, or, or compensation going out to survivors is over uh, $6 billion. Um, but as I said, the compensation wasn't uh, top of mind of most of the survivors, but we also had uh, this Truth Commission, which has shifted the paradigm in Canada, I think it's safe to say, uh, from ignorance, uh, racism, uh, non-interest uh, uh, in Indigenous peoples to many, many Canadians 
um, seeing uh, Indigenous people's reality in Canada through a much different uh, lens. And so it had a profound and is having a profound effect in Canada. The Truth Commission came up with 96 calls to action, which to all of which uh, address systemic uh, discrimination in our country, uh, in the health system, in education, in the justice system, in the banking system, uh, also in the private sector. So um, this was uh, this was a real lesson in terms of um, how to deal with. Um, mass human rights violations uh, in a real way, because had this not occurred, had the Indigenous people not led uh, and resolved this uh, issue in their own way, it would have just been another uh, colonial imposition of foreign values and foreign principles on peoples who had been under that very uh, thumb of colonialism. So it, uh, in order to genuinely deal with the problem, it had to be dealt with through the lens of indigenous law and indigenous legal principles. Um, so that's a very short uh, summary uh, of what was done, but I'd be, I'd be happy, of course, to answer questions in our Q&A period. But uh, I think for Canada, and I, I'm, I'm sure Catherine would agree with me, it's a, it's a different country than it was uh, prior to uh, especially the uh, Truth Commission revelations uh, that brought Canadians uh, to notice what their country really was uh, about in terms of its treatment of Indigenous peoples. And we can't really sit back on our laurels with some reputation of being this wonderful human rights observing country when we had this background uh, to contend with. Um, so I'll just leave it at that for the moment. Thank you very much um, and thank you for all three contributions and um, I'm trying to put a thread through this in a way in thinking about how the Commonwealth itself as an intergovernmental organisation, what role the Commonwealth has to play, what role do you think it might have to play in terms of addressing these issues? If you think about Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, Rwanda, um, if you think about these different peace and reconciliation processes and legal processes, but also educational experiences, you've all, you've all touched on, it, on the importance of education and the importance of healing. Um, so I wanted to ask you a two-part question. First of all, the role of the Commonwealth, do you think it should be doing more? But also, if you tie into that, for example, the recent, um, uh, um, the recent roads must fall, the result of the recent roads must fall, um, what is the distinction, do you think, between acknowledging the past mon and monumentalizing it or her heroizing it? Because, you know, monuments can also be educationally instructive. Uh, there are, for example, going back to my own background in Germany, many monuments to the murdered millions during the Holocaust. There is interestingly no monuments to slavery in the United Kingdom. So wh where, where does this, what role do Commonwealth governments have in educating and in learning from each other? And should they be doing more? And what is the distinction that you see between acknowledging the past and monumentalizing it? Um, I think if I could go to maybe to Catherine first. Sure, thank you very much. Um, that's, that's such a great question. Uh, CAM actually was probably the last um, international organization to hold a museums conference this year. We met in Cape Town from the uh, 9th to the 13th of March <laughs> and got out of Cape Town the day before um, the country shut down. But one of the things we did there was to write a declaration um, to the International Council of Museums and to the Commonwealth and, and, and to ourselves as members of the Museums Association. And, and one of the recommendations in there is that the, to the, the UK government needs to start, and the Commonwealth, need to start taking the whole issue of repatriation, restitution, reconciliation seriously. Uh, we need to look at the decolonization of museums as institutions. And uh, of course, museums throughout the Commonwealth were set up largely by colonial powers. And so we were left with that legacy in all, um, you know, all aspects of life. So we, we want to be reinventing the museum as being institutions that are for the benefit of contemporary societies rather than simply um, historical societies. So that's the role of the Commonwealth. I mean, it, you know, France and Germany have recently done projects about uh, the whole question of um, repatriation restitution and 
the Commonwealth hasn't, the, you know, the UK has not. So, so we need to look at that question. In terms of memorialization, I've been watching what's been happening the last month in particular really carefully um, with the number of monuments that are being torn down. Um, you know, as an historian and uh, you know, an arts lover, um, it, it's hard to see works of art being destroyed on the one hand. And it's hard to miss that learning opportunity to talk about who these people were and to recontextualize the monuments and to recontextualize the sites. So we've had the same issue with residential schools in Canada where there's a division. People, some people want to preserve the residential schools as museums or as historic sites or as monuments to what happened and other people want to and have burned them down, right? So, so we've, it, this is something that goes on and has gone on for a long time. Um, in fact, one of the statues, I don't remember which one now, but that was uh, taken down recently, people were saying, well, now we should put it in a museum. So you're, you're taking that out of the public sphere where monuments are you know, free and available and people see them every day and put them into a museum where people have to go to them and um, then look at them and have them recontextualized. I honestly don't know which is the best approach. I don't think we can leave them as they are, obviously, and and we need to we need to start building more monuments to people on the other side of all of this for sure, uh, because um, too much of it is too quiet and we don't see it. Um, in fact, there's a there's a plaque uh, to where my great 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 grandfather was working here in Western Canada and, and there's just a plaque. There's nothing there except for the plaque it, and an outhouse. <laughs> so, so when I, I made my husband take a picture of it one day and it's, he's like, he thinks it's a monument to an outhouse. No, it's a monument to something that doesn't happen anymore, but we just don't do a very good job of this. Yeah. You know, historically the monuments are put up there to stand on their own, to speak for themselves and they don't speak for themselves. We have to give, provide that context. Thank you. Thank you. And Hilary, if I could turn to you, you've, you've said that reparative justice will become the greatest global movement of the 21st century. And I don't know if you managed to hear any of the earlier debate about the Windrush scandal, um, uh, so which, which can make one feel slightly cynical that anything is going to change. I mean, do you see this uh, time as a time where Commonwealth governments or the Commonwealth itself as an organisation intergovernmental could do something more? Uh, thank you, Joanna. Well, first of all, let me say that um, I am a Windrush baby, so I fully understand that conversation. I was, I was taken to the UK from the Caribbean when I was uh, 13 years old as part of that Windrush migration. So even then, when I departed Barbados and found myself in Birmingham, England, and hey. looked around Birmingham as a teenager, and saw the names and the monuments in the city of Birmingham that reminded me of home, because these were the same people who owned the slave plantations in Barbados. So there I was growing up in Barbados uh, among the sugar plantations with names and recognitions of individuals. And I traveled across the Atlantic to Birmingham city and found the same people, the same names who owned the place I had just come from. So for me, that was an early wake up call as a teenager. But in the context of the, of the Commonwealth, uh, clearly the Commonwealth is built upon the infrastructure of the British Empire. And the infrastructure of the British Empire is built upon native genocide, slavery, and colonization. So the Commonwealth, as we know it today, uh, erupted or emerged on the foundations of these crimes against humanity and therefore cannot escape responsibility for its origins. You can run as far as you wish to go, but you are still attached to your roots. And, uh, and we need to recognize this. Uh, the Commonwealth has a very important role to play in maintaining, maintaining its own integrity, its own historical legitimacy. And going into the future, this is being redefined. It has to redefine its operations and it has to take decisions because it must not only be a, an excellent institution, which it tries to be, it also has to be an ethical institution. And it cannot escape uh, participating in the adjudication around the moral and legal issues that has given rise to it. In respect to the Rose um, issue, this is a conversation that is taking place globally around monuments, as you have said. Um, when the Colston, um, when the Colston uh, Monument was taken down in Bristol. And, and by the way, I was in Bristol six months earlier, meeting with the Vice Chancellor of Bristol University and discussing the roots of Bristol as a major British institution uh, with its Caribbean roots around Colston. I mean, Colston made his fortune 
uh, selling Africans to Barbados. And in Barbados, uh, the, second, the second city on the island, Barbados was the first major British slave market. And the second city uh, on the island was called Little Bristol. And Little Bristol uh, was the town where Colston had established his mercantile base. Uh, and he was responsible for importing over 10,000 enslaved Africans to the island, and Little Bristol was there. And I said to the Vice Chancellor, well, you are the main university in Big Bristol. Um, in Barbados, there is Little Bristol, and they are linked by Colston, whose monument has just taken down. What does this mean for Bristol University that has drank from the well of slavery in Little Bristol? And I left that conversation there. I spoke in the city. So six months later, the monument was torn down, and I felt some way connected to all of that because it was an old conversation. But I can tell you something else. I was involved as vice president of the UNESCO Slave Roots Project uh, with responsibility for the school's programs. And we carried out surveys in European schools uh, this was in the 90s. We carried out surveys in all the European countries in terms of how their history curriculum taught in the schools reflected any of this history. And we were shocked by the results of that survey. In the case of, in the case of Britain, only 5%, only 5% of the high schools in Britain had any references to slavery in their history curriculum at, the, at the, the level where teenagers were learning their national history. In the case of Portugal, it was zero. And Portugal was the country that shipped most Africans across the Atlantic. Britain might have made the most money out of it because they had the city of London to make their slave trade more efficient. They had Lloyds of London, they had the Bank of England, they had the British government legislating, providing funding, insurance coverage, risk management. And all of those skills were able to enable the British to be more efficient at slave trading and had a higher return on investment. But Portugal did the volume. And Portugal had no schools at all in which a uh, history of colonialism, slavery uh, was taught. So the, the, the public of Europe was systematically denied by intergenerational education, a complete detachment from their history that dealt with slavery, colonization, uh, the role of racism, and so on. I mean, one of the questions we ask adults at one moment, which country in Europe was the first country to legislate that African people are not human beings, that African peoples are property, real estate, and chattel? Which country in Europe first passed that law? And in Britain, no one, we, we sampled 10,000 people, and not one person in Britain in a sample of 10,000 knew that Britain was the first country to legislate that Africans were not human beings and, and were properties. And so these monuments that have emerged, they are not about teaching history, they're not about learning history. These monuments are celebrations of military triumphalism. They are celebrations, public celebrations, established at a moment in time to celebrate, to celebrate persons who committed mass murders and crimes against humanity. There are celebrations of white supremacy militarism. They don't have a teaching history or, or learning history. And the question is always asked, if, having, if the British people can imagine, for example, that they had lost the, the Second World War and had not defeated Hitler, but Hitler had won. And then the, the public places in England were filled with monuments of German generals and Hitler himself. And the British people and children had to go to school and college and university and see monuments of Goebbels on their campuses. And, and they were conquered people. How would they feel if the streets on which they lived were named after these German generals? How would they feel about it? And until the British and the European people come to think about that and, and imagine how they would feel about that, and rather than harden their souls and say, oh, these are monuments, leave them alone. They are pieces of art, leave them alone. They're not pieces of art. Pieces of art, therefore, 
are things that reflect the finest values and the imagination of a nation. They're not about celebrating crimes. And um, so I think we have this all wrong. Uh, the, these monuments are about the distortion of the truth. Uh, they're not about the celebration of historical knowledge and understanding. There are, in fact, dishonest representations of war crimes. And, and that is what we have to see them as. So that's my view. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And again, <clears throat> this the importance of of education from a basic level onwards, because as you say, the blindness uh, of majority of European people to what these statues represent must go back to the fact that curriculums ignore any any history that is not a nationally very very um, um, narrowly focused history. Um, so celebratory, celebratory history and a celebratory history. Um, so turning to you, Kathleen, just thinking about both of those. Uh, about which is what Commonwealth can do, but also about memorialization. You talked about how um, how people going through the Indian school settlement wanted healing and intergenerational healing and recognition of the suffering that they had 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 gone through. What lessons from this process can be transferred to, say, other Commonwealth countries, particularly, for example, Australia and New Zealand, where similar uh, uh, atrocities happened? Can you, can you perhaps address that? Um, sure, thank you for that. Um, yes, I think the, the biggest um, t lesson is that you listen to the survivors and what they want, because I mean, this is part of the problem is that they've always been told what they want or told what they need, and uh, it's resulted in, in terrible consequences. So um, what the survivors in, in our situation wanted uh, they did want memorialization. They did want uh, this never to happen again. And what that translated into in the settlement agreement was to have a research center and archive, uh, which uh, gathered together uh, for the first time in Canada in a specific way, uh, all of the information with respect to residential schools, all the government documents, all of the transcripts from the Truth Commission, all of the, if, if, if survivors wanted to release their individual statements and claims on for compensation, uh, they can do that um, for the next 15 years. Um, of course, in Canada, we're very much in, in, involved in this. Uh, it's not over uh, until at least uh, December of this year, and it's been in place since 2003. So, um, some of the memorialization efforts uh, are still, you know, in in early stages of being developed. But uh, but uh, one of the um, one of the memorializations that uh, has taken effect that's been quite uh, well received by the survivors is the House of Commons uh, created a stained glass window in its rotunda, uh, which has in 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 the form of stained glass the history you know, the development of, of the country. Um, and so there's a panel now devoted to residential schools, which would have been unheard of. Um, the research center and archive is very accessible and user-friendly, so people can access it by, um, from their homes uh, online. They can go to the research center. Um, they can, teachers can access teaching materials from there. So in, in many ways, that is uh, addressing this issue of, um, of remembering uh, that monuments don't necessarily address in depth. Uh, and uh, that, that will be an ongoing, and, and the funding has been committed uh, to that center so that uh, you know, it, will, it will not uh, disappear. Um, there was also a fund created in the settlement agreement uh, for communities to decide how they wanted to memorialize or commemorate the residential school experience. And many of them uh, created physical monuments, but others uh, spent the funds to have reunions of students, um, to create reading materials, to create curricula, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so I would agree with everybody who's talked so far about education. We saw that as absolutely fundamental to um, memorializing what happened and creating understanding and uh, future 
um, protections against the rabid racism that has been used against indigenous people. That's not to say that still doesn't exist in Canada, it does. Um, but we're on a different, uh, a different path in terms of recognizing it and learning about it. So in my view, um, other Commonwealth countries could look at the um, Canadian settlement, look at what the survivors themselves uh, stated what they wanted and how that has materialized into a variety of different um, different ways of, of uh, dealing with um, the memory and the um, reality of, of their situation. And of course, the effects of residential schools are very obvious today in Canada. I mean, the Indigenous people are the poorest people. They have the lowest um, uh, life expectancy rate. They have the highest numbers in prisons. Uh, they have the largest uh, percentages of um, substance uh, abuse issues, all of those, those problems today can be traced back to uh, largely the residential school experience and the racism associated with that. So um, I think the, the Commonwealth countries, many of whom have had the similar experiences, obviously Australia and New Zealand, but uh, I don't think that leaves, leaves others out. Um, that, that should be considering the same uh, issues, but the fundamental position I would state would be to consult with the survivors and find out what they want and how, see, how, how they can best, how they want to best represent what happened and have it memorialized. Thank you very much. And it, it, it just reminds me of what you said slightly earlier. I mean, two very powerful statements, one from Hillary on the statues are really celebrating representing war crimes. Um, and also, and what you said about how you uh, was actually enshrined in documents, you can't kill the Indian, but you can kill the Indian in the child. Uh, uh, very, very striking. So if we go think still about education, how do you view the relationship between reparations and the movement to decolonize and reform universities, if we take it to go beyond the curriculum? To the actual experience of a university and the and, and the impact of a university on a society and on which includes of course primary schools secondary schools curriculum teaching etc how, how, how do you see that relationship developing i'll go to hillary first on that please thank you joanna um it is not my style to draw reference to my own experience but a conversation such as this might require such an approach. Um, six years ago, when I was uh, invited to um, take responsibility for the university as vice chancellor, there was a conversation in the Caribbean that the vice chancellor of the University of the West Indies ought not to be in the vanguard of a reparations discourse. That this, that is not the role of a vice chancellor. That vice chancellors ought to be raising money and and um, you know being outside of political narratives, outside of popular discourse, and we ought to be removed from the the center of gravity of society seeking to go forward. But we should deal with content of programs, fundraising, financial matters, and basically the financial sustainability of the institution. And that was an argument that was made. When I was asked to, as a candidate, when I was asked to, to comment on that, um, I recall making the statement that the University, University of the West Indies emerged out of the popular rebellion of the 1930s, where the Caribbean workers movement called for decolonization, the end of empire, and promoted the, the, the constructs of nationhood and nation building. And out of that mass revolt of the 30s, uh, and the British, of course, would have done what they normally do, you set up a commission of inquiry. And so a commission of inquiry was established to find out why it was that the Caribbean folks were revolting against the empire. And one of the recommendations that came out of the report was the establishment of a university college that would create 
a small cadre of professionals in the region who could assist the British in maintaining the empire. That is, the university ought to create a, a, a community of compliant citizens who would facilitate the perpetuation of the empire. So that is how my university emerged. But immediately upon its, con its construction, the student population demanded the foregrounding of the relationship between higher education and decolonization. And therefore, I was able to argue that far from it, that the vice chancellor should not be at the center of it. The vice chancellor should be the leader of this movement because the purpose of education is to expand the imagination and consciousness of young people, of younger generations, to expose them to the historical truth, to enable them to uh, see their future in just and, uh, and ethical ways and contribute towards humanity at its finest. And therefore, I see that task in the post-colonial situation as incomplete. And therefore, my role is, uh, as a vice chancellor is to facilitate the, the maturity of these conversations. So um, basically then, uh, our University of the West Indies and all of its disciplinary diversity is so embedded in the narrative of decolonization, of uh, the pursuit of civil rights, human rights, the celebration of humanity, the creation and celebration of diversity. Because the Caribbean is one of the most diverse communities in the world. And in fact, the Caribbean was the world's first global village. We have in the Caribbean everything and have had every, every culture of civilization for 300 years because that's what colonization and slavery did. We brought people from Africa, we brought people from Asia, the European scheme, we had the indigenous peoples, and peoples were brought into the heart of empire in the Caribbean. So diversity and eth ethic, ethic, ethnic diversity is the infrastructure of the Caribbean world. And therefore to celebrate that has to be to oppose all conversations that seek to differentiate, that seeks to establish hierarchies of ethnicities, that seek to exploit the relationship between ethnic groups for political or economic gain. So everything that we do as an organic university is fighting against the tide of history, pushing back the historical experience in fact, de detaching ourselves from the colonial scaffold and moving into a future that is more about celebration of diversity, the dignity of everyone, the equality of everyone. So we are in pursuit of the human ideal. And in pursuit of the human ideal, therefore, we have to be critical of our historical past, where those ideals were denied, suppressed, and criminalized. So. I believe that uh, we are in that, that river moving towards the ocean and the ocean is humanity at its best and that's where we're heading. So um, I see myself as, a, as someone in the canoe who is paddling down river to get to that ocean. So yes, um, I, think, I think we have a very, very important role to play as a university in reshaping the future. Thank you. Uh, and Catherine, I mean, perhaps if you turn that question around a little bit to the decolonization of museums um, and how museums can act in a reparative manner. I mean, through how, how is it through the narratives they tell? Is it economically? Is it through um, uh, cultural restitution? How, how do museums uh, behave in this sort of decolonization ecosystem? If you like. Right. So, so museums are part of the public education sector, and we we do sometimes work with universities, and and sometimes not. And unfortunately, there's a, there's too big a gulf between the two. And I'd like to see us collaborating more. Um, so, so that's in terms of the university question. And here in in Canada, certainly, liberal arts education is not. Uh, it's being undercut by our government, which uh, particularly in Alberta, which has a very strong science and technology focus and doesn't see the value of learning history. So, so as museums, we have an even more important role to play in terms of lifelong learning and trying to teach 
all sides of an issue and providing multiple voices and perspectives and all of that. So um, in terms of decolonization, uh, it's a question of um, changing the governance and changing the operations of museums to ensure that you have people from all different backgrounds involved in them and they can't be just white people running museums. Um, it, you know, we have to, have, you can't be working with others and not including others in the decision making and uh, um, in the way allowing their own voices to speak for their own situations. So, so for us, the indigenous population is one huge issue, but we also have you know, so many migrant communities in, in Canada that museums tend to talk about rather than with and for. So uh, it's changing that whole structure so that we um, are much more community-based, much more grassroots, um, much more inclusive in, in the way museums behave and providing work and opportunities and and all of that. I mean, there's a real revolution going on. So I'm a, a, a Parks Canada, our National Park Service has established a, an Indigenous Cultural Heritage Advisory Committee, which I'm a part of. And there are eight of us um, who have been um, given the task of actually breaking down the way parks functions and advising how to look at things from an Indigenous perspective. And um, because of that celebratory approach to history, which is, you know, the way um, Governments certainly like to think about history. Is is uh, we're, the, people always talk about celebrating our past, and it just makes me cringe because the past is not something to be celebrated. The, the path is something to be reckoned with, to be understood, to be um, confronted, and and so that's what we're trying to do. They they have all of these sites that are dedicated, I guess, like memorialization, you know, to to specific individuals or events or activities, and we're always trying to put the indigenous twist on that. And so I, I think it's just constantly being a reminder to people that. That that old view of history, which looks at the you know the forts and the monuments and the military successes, that's just not that's only one side of the story, and and it's not not going to take us into the future. Thank you. And actually, uh, Kathleen, then on that, it's not just about um, how we view history; it's also about how we what kind of education systems and hierarchy. Are, are are implicit in the way that we teach. And you've talked, I think, about the need to change conventional legal practices to be far more inclusive and recognize um, indigenous traditions when people are seeking transitional justice but is there other ways of mainstreaming or of, uh, becoming a, a much more inclusive uh, a way of, of creating curriculums in, in universities in Canada building on on the recent Canadian government um, recognition of past injustices right um, <clears throat> yes, well, um, my can best answer this question by, by looking at what uh, our university is doing. And, and our university is not unlike many universities across uh, the country. But what our university decided to do was, as they call it, indigenization of the university, which um, is attempting to address the systemic um, discrimination uh, in our universities that have existed uh, from the time universities, of course, were created in, in Canada against in, indigenous uh, uh, peoples and their participation in higher education. So um, the indigenization includes looking at our entire uh, way of functioning as a university, who we hire, uh, not just as professors uh, and researchers, but administrators and everyone in the, in the entire structure. We look at um, our students, um, our admission policies, um, our, our ways of, of, of assessing applications, for example, to the law school. Um, we look at um, curriculum, of course. And so this indigenization project is intended to try to get to the heart of uh, the systems that have worked for so many years against not just indigenous peoples, all minorities, but our focus uh, after the, the Truth Commission calls to action uh, has been on indigenous peoples. Now myself, I teach uh, in the law school a couple of courses. I teach indigenous law and I teach indigenous legal theory. Um, it attracts usually uh, students, it attracts indigenous students, of course, and it attracts students who probably are well on the way to understanding um, the need and the reality of discrimination in Canada. My, my concern is that 
uh, there's still um, there's still seminar courses. They're not mainstream, um, and so one of the things I'm trying to do at my law school is to, uh, with my, my colleagues, is to try and get uh, a, a first year. First year is always the most important year in law school because it's the um, year where they take their compulsory foundational courses and they take them extremely seriously. Uh, because they want to be invited by law firms to to work in the summer and to get articles. So uh, one of the tasks that we're trying to do is to uh, have a course on Indigenous peoples in the law as a mandatory first year course, which would be uh, taken by all of the students and um, they would uh, pay very serious attention to it instead of just seeing Indigenous law or Indigenous legal principles as an interesting um, option to take in the upper years. Uh, so that's that's one thing. But um, uh, we also are looking at the way in which and, and, uh, we invite guest speakers, who those speakers are, when Indigenous people come to campus, that they're treated in a way that reflects um, Indigenous culture. For example, if you invite an elder to the class or somebody to, to come and talk to the law students, they're presented with uh, tobacco, which is a traditional way of honoring and respecting an elder, the students will, uh, or faculty will acknowledge um, the fact that uh, that the university sits on indigenous uh, uh, land and territories and so on. So, you know, and that sounds trivial perhaps to some, but um, when it's seen as an entire package, the idea here is to make the university a more comfortable place for Indigenous students to study, to welcome Indigenous students to apply in the first place, um, to look at the curriculum seriously and to see uh, that from a legal perspective that our, our legal system is not the end all and the be all by any means, that it is very deficient when it comes to recognizing other legal systems. I mean, the Indigenous people of Canada had a legal system, they had laws before they were colonized or they wouldn't have survived. Um, obviously, uh, survival depends on having uh, regulations and rules and values and principles, and they survived here for thousands of years without uh, having British law. And so recognizing that those legal systems exist and educating our lawyers and judges and uh, academics to uh, teach the law in that manner is, is a project that's presently underway. Uh, one university in Canada, for example, and University of Victoria is now offering a law degree in Indigenous law uh, so that graduates of that university will be able to have a dual degree of Indigenous law and uh, Canadian law uh, as we know it, and will be able to take uh, some of these arguments uh, and Indigenous principles and values into the courtrooms of the nation. And so when, if and when that happens, I think we'll begin to see um, some really significant changes in the, 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 um, the framework of our country, the framework, which of course is law. And uh, once we see, and, and there have been, I don't want to, to sound uh, that this is completely, you know, a brand new project. The, the Supreme Court of Canada has recognized uh, that indigenous law exists. But then, of course, the next challenge is, okay, what does that look like in family law? What does that look like in property law? What does that look like in personal injury? What does that look like in criminal law? And so it's that path that we're endeavoring uh, to go down. And the universities uh, have to play an absolutely critical role, uh, as do law societies and their education programs. And they're starting uh, now to add those elements to uh, the education uh, requirements of practicing lawyers and uh, and put them into credit uh, if, if uh, for example if a lawyer attends a, a sessions or a course on indigenous law they can use that as credit towards their requirements for ongoing education continuing education so you know there's many many things that universities uh, can do um, but I think the most effective ways will be uh, projects and programs and um, uh, initiatives to address the systemic forms of discrimination that most of us have been beneficiaries of uh, that are unconscious forms of bias that we just carry on as business as usual and invite the odd Indigenous speaker to the 
university. That's not going to cut it. Um, and so it seems that uh, the way in which real change will occur is in these fundamental uh, decisions about how, who, and what uh, we teach, and also who are in positions of power at the university, who's the administration, who are the people who are uh, the deans and associate deans and the tenured professors, uh, mm -hmm. and who are receiving research grants, and what are the criteria for scholarships. Those are the kinds of things that uh, will make the changes that hopefully in the future will our universities will look different. Thank you. And actually, uh, every, uh, many of the things that you've just touched on are things that the Peace and Reconciliation Network are looking at. And uh, there's been an awful lot of hyperbole on Black Lives Matter and statements uh, from many universities saying how abhorrent uh, uh, the, the inequalities that COVID has exposed the death of, of the murder of George Floyd as being. But what I'd quite like to see is if you then look at the record of these universities, for example, in the numbers of uh, uh, um, uh, black and minority ethnic professors, for example, I'm talking about the UK right now, it is still pretty shameful. And until we look at our, um, our advancement um, procedures and we look at our recruitment procedures and we look at how we work with our schools, we're not going to change very much. And the ACU is actually committed to uh, creating a new, uh, to, to working with our universities to think about what are the actual fundamental things that could change and what kind of a charter could universities then sign up to that would actually create those changes and provide some power for, move, for movement of change rather than just talking about it. Um, so thank you very much for that. I'm now gonna open it up to the floor. We've got quite a few comments and questions and I'm going to try and um, um, summarize some for you. So the first one is I think more of a, uh, 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 um, an observation from Thomas Woods. Uh, while there may be disagreement as to the form that remedies can or should take, no society claiming to function pursuant to the dictates of the rule of law can simply leave historical wrongs undressed, unredressed. And as Kathleen said, solutions lie partly within the control of the legislatures and partly within the jurisdiction of the courts. So he's saying that a multi-pronged approach to the reparations imperative, any initiatives to, uh, the Commonwealth can pursue that may raise the consciousness of the judiciaries in Commonwealth states about historical wrongs and the legal remedies available to respond to them can only help. And actually tied to that a little bit is a question from John Wilson to all of you. Slavery has always been evil and wrong, but how far should we go back in condemning the slavers the tribal chiefs that sold the slaves to the traders, the Arabs that ran a slave trade from Eastern Africa. And if I may add one to this, because I think it's relevant from, from um, Karen Wolf, which is actually asking about your background as historians, which I think is implicit in the question before, on how your work as scholars has influenced and informed your work as institutional leaders. Um, so um, I hope I've summarised those correctly. There are a few more which I'll come back to once I've asked you to comment on those. Um, and I don't mind who, whoever wants to go first. Oh, okay, okay. Maybe I should have <laughs> have a first crack at that. Um, Fifteen years ago. Um, when I was the provost at the Barbados campus of the UWI, we instituted an indigenous people's scholarship. The indigenous population of the Caribbean had been reduced from 3 million down to less than 50,000. Uh, it was a genocidal history and we have small groups of communities in the remote parts of Dominica and St. Vincent, from a region that was filled with people. Um, and the reason why the Barbados campus took the lead on this project was that um, when the English arrived in Barbados to colonize it in 1627, um, and they wrote back to the king to say, we have planted the flag uh, on the island in your honor, but there are no people on the island. But having surveyed it, there are houses everywhere. <laughs> so they found an empty island that was filled with houses 
because Barbados was one of the most densely populated Native American islands. And the Spanish would raid the island for slaves to go to Mexico to work in the mines. And the Portuguese would raid the island to carry the Indians off to Brazil to work on the plantation. So the, the island was emptied. So Barbados began its English journey as an empty island with a legacy of genocide. Now, moving that history forward uh, into the present time, and citizens of the island have no idea whatsoever until they visit the museum that this was once a densely populated island with, filled with houses. The archaeologists have done their work. It's in the museum. It is not part of the public imagination. It's not part of public knowledge. So when we started this project, to bring indigenous peoples out of the reservations into the university. I remember there was a sense of joy and excitement, but it was also trepidation because the English have said that these indigenous peoples who they called Caribs after, after the Columbus uh, intervention, the British have said that these Caribs were cannibals and that had filtered into the global iconography that these native peoples were cannibals. And therefore, we were bringing these people onto the campus. And the, some of the Black students who were told all through their education that Caribs were cannibals, and there was this silence that we were bringing cannibals onto the campus. It was the most extraordinary thing. We took it for granted that this was nonsense in mythology, but we realized that there was a subliminal fear that we were bringing these cannibals onto the campus and, and that we had to monitor this. And therefore, we had to put in place a management system to gradually introduce these indigenous students into the heartland of the university. You connect that with the fact that the British judiciary has taken a decision that it will not allow cases to come before it in respect of reparatory justice for anything that the government has done or the nation has done before 1950. So therefore, you cannot get a case for reparatory justice into the British courts for any event or process that took place before 1950. Because the legislature has gone into an agreement with the judiciary, the various branches of government, to say that we, the state, shall not be subject to any discourse around crimes committed against humanity before 1950. So the entire slavery colonization, that entire period is blocked by the judiciary in terms of litigation. That is a political decision to protect the British nation from any legal encounter with its past. And the past is defined the past is defined by the British intergovernment structure as anything that happened before 1950 is remote past. So there is a definition of the remoteness of the past. Now, clearly that is a very blunt instrument that says, this is not about justice. This is not about ethics and morality. This is about political power. And so the question which is put to you about how remote is remote. Well, apparently in Britain, anything, anything before 1950 is very remote and not subject to recuperation. So again, is that a boundary that historians can recognize? Or are we told categorically, all of us in the human rights movement don't even think about it uh, because the state has taken the decision that we are okay after 1950, we, we don't think we have committed any crimes after 1950, but we've committed thousands before, so let us draw the line. What is that all about? I think it would be a very interesting question for the person who has made the question to reflect upon it himself. Um, if you're waiting for us to weigh in. Um... Sorry, I'm, I was on mute. I was gonna say, if, if you wanted to come in here, yes. Sure. Um... In terms of how 
<coughs> my academic career has been shaped um, towards activism. I think that um, being in law, uh, you either go, you choose one path or the other, either accepting the norms and principles and uh, understandings of the laws that we have or the critical, uh, taking the critical legal studies uh, path. And that seems to be often the way that law schools break down in terms of activism of their participants. But um, I was very involved in the early days of my uh, tenure uh, in the women's movement and looking at the law through the lens of uh, you know, feminism and understanding that the law was not made for women. And that understanding was profound uh, to me. And uh, it, it guided a lot of my choices and uh, certainly in research and writing and a lot of my uh, activism. Uh, from there, it became quite obvious that, you know, in, the, in my context that uh, the judiciary uh, is a source of a lot of the uh, issues that were facing women in their unconscious or conscious bias, uh, gender bias in their decision making. And uh, I started working uh, with others around the world, actually, in Commonwealth countries, uh, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, uh, India, England, uh, Namibia, other places where the problems are almost the very same. Uh, judges approaching their, their positions uh, in a very um, narrow uh, fashion, which it doesn't allow them to understand or take into account the realities of other people that come before them. Uh, so the judicial education uh, projects that I was involved in around the world um, led to me um, working on a legal team about the genocide uh, perpetrated on Bosnia uh, by uh, the Serbian uh, forces uh, in that country and how uh, the genocide convention itself was gender biased against women, and uh, particularly in, in way in which the militarization of, of sex uh, happened in that country. And then uh, along came the Rwanda um, genocide as well. And um, we saw the power of, of activism and interpretation uh, reflected in the decisions, particularly in Rwanda, where the female judge uh, who was uh, opining and judging on genocide cases in Rwanda um, answered these arguments that the genocide convention itself was was not looking at genocide through the reality uh, of women's experience. So um, things like forced pregnancies, for example, that happened in Bosnia uh, could be just as genocidal as forced abortion. And uh, so that was a huge education as well on the international uh, level. And um, then, uh, you know, and more recently, uh, my involvement with the uh, Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement uh, and looking at um, the ways in which this happened and rolled out in Canada over many, many years was so very Similar, I could draw upon these experiences to help understand, help my, help me understand, and help my analysis of the law and the way in which it had managed to cover up and uh, hide these realities from the Canadian population was so profound, and that the answers that uh, were required in order to make change could not be found in our traditional courts and institutions and understandings of legal principles. So, you know, it was a combination in my own personal experience of all of those things uh, that I think took me to the place and enabled me to have the opportunity, frankly, uh, of working uh, on this, which has been the most rewarding and biggest project of my life, uh, is this uh, settlement uh, agreement and, and what has flowed from it. So I'm not sure if that was that was what you wanted us uh, to address in terms of our our, our own activism, but um, that's the best way that uh, that I think I can answer uh, that question at the moment. Thank you very much. And uh, I've got um, um, uh, Catherine. Do you want to come in here? I'll just say quickly that I, th I think I also came at it from a perspective of gender because my undergraduate experience was incredibly chauvinistic. And uh, my, as an historian, my thesis topic was um, about the garment manufacturing industry in Alberta. And I was told that I had to take 
courses in home economics in graduate school. I hadn't taken home ec since I was in elementary school, but because it was garment manufacturing, they assumed it was about women, not a labor study or any of these other things. So it was, it, I had a very hard time in the history department. And then, as I, as I mentioned in my PhD, it was a racism issue. So it's, um, I think my academic experience wasn't a positive one at all. And I think that's part of what led me into public education as opposed to being in the academic world. This, the question about 1950 though was a really serious concern to me because you know, indigenous people have a very long view of history. And um, you know, when, when Canada was celebrating the 150th anniversary in 2017, indigenous people are saying, well, 150 years? No, we've been here a lot longer than that. So it, you know, we, we can't, we cannot give an arbitrary cutoff like 1950. That's absolutely ludicrous. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have a question from Freddie, uh, Freddie Folks, who is apparently, I think he's here. Do you want to ask it yourself, Freddie? Or would you like me to um, summarize it? Uh, not sure if he's still there. So basically, it's a, it, it is a question to Professor Beckles. How might activists in UK academic institutions such as Oxbridge Colleges best work with the Carricom Commission? to work towards achieving their 10 point plan. And if money can be extracted from colleges for reparations, what is the best way for paying them out? So is the path taken by Glasgow a good model for other institutions to follow? And, and, and when you respond to that, um, um, Henry, if you could also perhaps think about some of the other models like Georgetown um, University, and then I might ask each of you to think about it also in terms of the, uh, if you broaden the question to, should it be institutions? Should it be government? Should it be private sector, who should be responsible for reparations if they were ever to be achieved, financial reparations? So I'll go to, to Hilary first, please. Thank, thank you, Joanna. Um, first of all, um, I, I think individuals within institutions uh, ought to reflect upon uh, the idea that their universities ought to be not only excellent academically, but they should be uh, ethical in terms of their relationship to the discourse of justice. And uh, that's the decision that everyone should take. Um, I have spoken at many universities uh, addressing students and academic staff, and I asked them to reflect upon that. Given the history you know of your institution, uh, has your institution taken stock of uh, addressing and redressing all of these fundamental issues, not only in terms of race and class, but also gender. How does it relate to this world of ethical conduct and it's for individuals to decide if their universities are ethical in their conduct? I mean, you might very well know that it's excellent in terms of its academic standing, its research and so on, but is it, is it ethical in terms of its relationship to society? So those are questions that should be asked. And, um, in our own institution, we have said that we must address the ethical dimensions of our interactions and our existential relationship to society. We have to address the question of ethics, and this is very important to us. I was, um, I was uh, a principal partner in shaping the Glasgow, the Glasgow model. Um, in respect of how that institution having been empowered, enriched uh, by the capital of slavery uh, and the, the fact that the city that gave life to that university was so deeply embedded in the profits of slavery and slave trading. Um, it was a critical epicenter of the slavery enterprise, and now all of that filtered into the university and gave life to the university. Uh, the half has not been told, if I may say. But that conversation says that the, the arrangement which we were going to negotiate was a repository adjustment strategy, which sought to repair the damage that has been done. Now, the Scottish were very instrumental in shaping and designing the slave system of Jamaica, Barbados, and Dominica, fundamentally. They were in the vanguard of management, of ownership, and so on. Uh, and their identity is all over the place. It's, it, it's not coincidental that my middle name is McDonald's. I don't know where that came from, but, but there you go. The, 
even in my name, there's a Scottish legs. But um, the, the issue there was to identify a project that uh, could be used as the basis of some kind of atonement. And in the Glasgow case, the two areas or pillars that we thought that Glasgow could make a fundamental contribution to uh, is the area of public health. The black people in the Caribbean, uh, if, you, if you use the marker, Joanna, if you use the marker of chronic diseases, non-communicable chronic diseases, hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and so on. If you use that marker, the black people in the Caribbean are the sickest people in the world. Now, 60% of all the black people in the Caribbean over the age of 50 have diabetes or hypertension or both. It is a pandemic of chronic diseases. My own island, Barbados, is classified in the medical fraternity as the amputation capital of the world. More people are losing their limbs uh, in the Caribbean, Barbados especially, and Jamaica as a result of complications from diabetes than per capita than any country in the world. And all of this is connected to the fact that for 300 years, the, or the enslaved and colonized people of the Caribbean were forced to eat salt and sugar every day. It was, you must, you must understand that in the Caribbean, sugar was not just a sweetener. Sugar was a meal. People ate sugar as a meal because that was what we produced. We, we were the world's largest producers of cane sugar and we ate sugar as a meal. We snacked on sugar between meals. You had a handful of sugar, you ate sugar. And one of the problems you know, faced with is that there's a tremendous inability to metabolize salt and sugar, thus this pandemic of chronic diseases. Now, all of this is the legacies of slavery and colonization. So the result of the end product of colonization is that you now have these very, very sick people uh, and their public health has to be uh, addressed. So, this is where we have built the Glasgow UWA reparations project upon the issue of bringing our scientists together to treat with this matter of the public health pandemic. And there are, they have committed to providing the financial resources to enable this to happen. We, we have the biochemistry, we have the science, we don't have the laboratories. Uh, they have the laboratories. We have the scientists, we could get together and we could make this happen. We could find drugs and we could develop a new culture around nutrition for the long run. But in the short term, we have to save lives. We have to save lives. So many people are having strokes. Young people in their 30s and 40s are having strokes because of all of these, pand these pandemics. So that is one model. But in the context of the broader Caribbean, the CARICOM model is a development discourse model. I know that in some countries they are talking about providing um, financial inputs to families that have emerged in the last two generations from slavery, families that would, whose properties were destroyed by the state. I mean, we are all watching the situation in Tulsa, where the black community had built this magnificent town and it was burnt to the ground by white supremacists. Um, hundreds, 350 people were murdered, and the entire business and commercial accumulation of the black community in the state was raised to the ground. And now they have to start all over again. And this was done with the support of the state. This was done with the support of the state. What should the state do? I mean, the people who lost, and this is 1921. Similar things have happened in the Caribbean, where black enterprises were destroyed and uh, white supremacists could not tolerate black competition and all of that stuff. But our model is a development model that says to Britain and to all of Europe, look at this mess that you have left behind in the Caribbean at the end of empire. Look at it. Uh, the case of Jamaica, for example, when Jamaica became independent in 1962, after 307 years of British rule, uh, 60% of the black people in Jamaica were illiterate. 
and they were told, now go and build, go and build a nation, go and build a modern competitive nation uh, with a 60% illiteracy, absolute, absolute atrocity in terms of housing. 70% of the people lived in the ghettos in shanty towns. So with the shanty town base and the illiteracy base, they were told by the nation. Uh, the Jamaicans, of course, have done magnificently as all the Caribbean countries to, to create a democracy out of that rubble of post-colonial destruction, to craft democracy and nation building out of that world without any economic help. So we are really saying in the Caribbean that the European countries, Britain especially, in the case of the English territory, must come back to the scene and participate in cleaning up the mess that they have left behind, that we have inherited. And quite frankly, that legacy and that colonial mess has been really very debilitated of nation building. It really has overwhelmed the Caribbean, the depth, the depth and the resilience of that poverty. Now, Britain has to come back to do that. Now, when we say Britain, we mean the state, the British state. We also mean the institutions that were enriched by that process. So that the banking system, the Lloyds of London, the Barclays, the Royal Banks of Scotland, all of those institutions that finance made tremendous profits out of this reality. And of course, that includes also the Church of England and civil society that owned plantations, that owned slaves. The slaves in the Caribbean that were owned by the Church of England were branded on their chest with the letters C of E, Church of England, and they were bought at the slave auction by the bishops and they were stamped C of E, and they were sent to work. Many of those provincial churches, Joanne, that you see all over England were built from the profits of the plantations owned by the Church of England in the Caribbean. The wealth went back to England and the bishops of London who had responsibility for slavery, they took the money and they built all of these provincial churches. So it is about the state and its, and its institutions that it empowered to return to a development conversation in the space to assist in cleaning up the mess that they have left behind. Education, health, public housing, these are the areas that we are speaking about. So that's the model that we are speaking about uh, in terms of Caribbean reparations, really is an injection of resources targeted around legacies to help to clean up and remove those legacies to alleviate the suffering that the people are still experiencing today as a result of that history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hilary. And we are running out of time, so I'd ask um, Kathleen and Catherine just to your finishing remarks, really, if you want to address the exact points around reparations or if you want to make two more general points, please do. If I go to Catherine first. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I would just like to add to that that museums as institutions, we're very moralistic institutions, and yet uh, we have been complicit, if not leaders, in a lot of these problems with um, the removal of objects of spiritual cultural significance to communities from their homelands to the UK and to other parts of the world. So the whole question of uh, repatriation, restitution, reconciliation, um, that's a huge aspect of it. And until museums that are in the power positions are ready to have that conversation with us about how to transfer things over. And the argument often is given is, well, they don't, they, you don't have the capacity to look after these things if we gave them back to you, so they're not, or they wouldn't exist at all if we hadn't taken them, you know, those kinds of arguments. So we really need to have a much more serious conversation. We've been working on this for 40 years and frankly not getting as far as we would like. And there have been some major accomplishments in that time, but there's still a long, long way to go. So thank you. Thank you very much. And, and Kathleen? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to make the point that, you know, the framework for reparations in Canada is reconciliation. Um, so I think that's a very, very important concept here in Canada. Um, this, the relationship, it's all about relationships, in particular the relationship between the state and Indigenous peoples. Constitutionally, um, the federal government took on the responsibility of 
Indians, as they say in the BNA Act, the British North America Act. And so more than provincial or municipal governments, the state has the responsibility uh, for uh, Indigenous people in, in Canada. And it was under that power that the residential schools were established. And then, of course, they employed others to do their work for them of assimilation. And in the residential school context, that was the churches. So the churches had to be involved in uh, the whole project of reparations because it was their actors that often, you know, uh, injured the children physically and mentally and emotionally and so on. So um, they were co-defendants in this action. And at the negotiation table, uh, they, had, they had equal participation with the Indigenous peoples to arrive at, at reparations. But I think it's important to understand that um, in Canada, the, the residential schools was one piece of the assimilation project. There was huge wealth uh, derived from Indigenous lands uh, through theft of lands, through breach of treaty promises and so on. So today, the, the um, biggest um, cases in courts and the biggest negotiation tables in Canada today are about land claims. And if Canada wants to reconcile with the Indigenous peoples in terms of their relationship, it's, it's understood, widely speaking, that, um, that these land claims have to be resolved. Um, and of course, the wealth uh, in, in our situation in Canada, we're a natural resource country, uh, oil and gas, timber, uh, hydroelectric power, and so on are our main backbone of our economy. And those are that economy has been derived from indigenous lands. And so although the re residential school was one important piece and uh, involved individuals as well as the collectives, uh, the, the whole issue of land uh, in Canada is, uh, is paramount. Uh, so, and, and it's the federal government that uh, has either given land away to settlers or stolen land or participated in illegal seizures of land and benefited many private sector organizations, companies, individuals. Uh, but the way in which uh, I believe it's appropriately dealt with and it is being uh, uh, dealt with uh, piece by piece is with the federal government um, acknowledging what's been done and, and compensating in land and in, uh, and in uh, uh, money terms uh, these uh, these issues so on sorry so so that's that's basically my answer to the question is the mo the main responsibility here is with the state but then when they've employed other actors to carry out uh, their their policies that they also must participate in the whole uh, reparations uh, project thank you so much and thank you to to, to all three of you. It's been an extraordinary session for me personally. It's about, I mean, it is about reckoning with the past. It isn't about um, celebrating any past. And I think you've raised some really fascinating things. For example, the cutoff of 1950, the non-communicable diseases, which actually could be used as a marker uh, uh, of the impact of colonialism in most Commonwealth countries, if not all of them. And so we won't have room for any more, but I just want to thank all three of you for an extraordinarily rich discussion and hand back to, to Philip to, to wrap up. Thank you. Jo Joanna, thank you. let me thank you for, for excellent chairing and, um, and echo your thanks to um, our three really excellent speakers. I think um, each of the panels today has been a kind of masterclass. And I'm so pleased that it's, they've all been recorded. And I think people will go back to, to these sessions and, and really take a huge amount from them. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, we're, we're gonna have a little break. I know it's morning for our speakers. Um, here in, in England, it's a rather nice warm evening, the warmest day of the year so far. So I, might just get a, a breath of fresh air uh, away from the screen. Uh, and then we start again at six o'clock with a session on LGBT rights in the Commonwealth. Thank you all so much.